Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, episode 358. Hi, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Welcome back. Hey, I'm so glad you're here. Today's guest is Mike Simmons. Mike is a real estate investor, podcast host, speaker, as well as the author of the book, Level Jumping, where he shares the principles that allow him to take his business from virtually nothing to over $1 million in 12 months. Mike has mentored hundreds of entrepreneurs and helped them grow their business. In addition to his business success, Mike has shared the stage with people like Gary V, Jocko Willink, Russell Brunson, Andy Frisella and so many more. Well, today, Mike and I talk about his path from working at a corporate union job to now blazing his own trail in investing in real estate and how you can do the exact same. Going to be lots of great nuggets here, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. Mike, hey, welcome to the show. With that, hey, Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, man, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's going to be fun. It's our pleasure. Well, Mike, hey, can you start by telling us a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you come from, all that good stuff? Yeah, totally. So a Midwest boy born and raised in Michigan. Uh, Family was, you know, blue collar automotive focused. Uh, Dad worked for Ford. um, And uh, and we were kind of just raised with that blue collar mentality. There was no entrepreneurs in my life. There was nobody encouraging me to do anything on my own. In fact, it was quite the opposite. It was really more discouraged. And in fact, it was discouraged the way that like prime rib is discouraged at McDonald's in that it's not on the menu. (laughs) You can't ask for it, right? So it wasn't even an option that was presented to me as a kid growing up. So I did exactly what I thought I was supposed to do. I finished high school. Uh, I got a job at a company that was union based and it was a, you know, the UPS, not to be secretive, it was UPS. So a big, strong union, right? And my dad was ecstatic. He's like, hey, you're in a union and you have this good income and the stability. And I thought, yeah, I am. I don't need college. Like, why would I go to college? You know, it's where I'm going to retire. They don't require me to have education. So, I started working at UPS as a young man. By the time I was 24, if I didn't go to the chiropractor three times a week, I couldn't get out of bed. Like, that's how bad oh, wow. my back was wrecked. Like, I wrecked my back because this is an old reference, and it might be too old for a lot of your audience. But there's a famous Lucy Lucille Ball show where she's doing the chocolate factory, and the chocolates are coming so fast, she's throwing in her mouth, putting them in her clothes, like she can't keep up. <laughs> That's how it was at UPS for me, at least where I was at. The boxes and the, the belt go so fast that you're trying to put these boxes and load them, but they're going too fast to do it properly. So I was lifting heavy boxes and I was twisting at the waist. I was bending at the waist, all the dumb things that you shouldn't do when you're lifting heavy stuff. And I just wrecked my back. So by the time I was 24, I couldn't get out of bed without the help of a chiropractor. So I switched gears, started working in the automotive industry, got a job there in sales. Sorry, I'm sitting behind a desk now. It's a little bit easier on my back for sure. And I thought, once again, this is where I'm going to retire. I love this company. This is great. I'm in the automotive industry, right? It's everything you want when you're in Michigan. And you know, the industry went through a real downturn around 2000. And I realized I'm a commodity at this point. Like There is nothing that makes me special. I don't have a degree. And I only have a few years, handful of years of experience in the industry. If I got let go, I don't know if I would hire me. So maybe I do need that education I kept putting off. So as an adult with two kids, a mortgage, a wife, and a full-time job. I went back to school and got my bachelor's degree and my income doubled like literally overnight. I got my degree. I applied for a company, a job at a company that I wanted and got it and my income doubled. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Once again, I'm back on track, right? Yeah. Now it's a white collar track for me. And I knew that the positions I wanted, I knew the jobs within the company and the industry that I really, really wanted mostly because they made a lot of money, but I knew what I wanted. (laughs) And as I started working at these companies in a white collar capacity, I started getting to know the folks that had the job that I thought that I wanted someday. 
and they were all miserable. They hated their wife. They hated their husband. They hated their kids. They hated their job, hated their life, hated the company. Like they were just miserable people. And I thought, my gosh, this is what I'm trying to get to. Like, this is my goal. This is awful. So I thought, all right, I'm on this track. I've got my degree. I've got a good income. You know, we're living that lifestyle. I just need to figure out how to make my own money work for me. So I started investigating how to invest my money for retirement. And initially it was stocks and the stock market and learning that whole world. And long story short, I hated it. I just, I couldn't stay interested. I couldn't stay engaged. I knew I needed to, but I just couldn't stay engaged because I didn't like it. But as I was doing that research, I stumbled across real estate and real estate actually did excite me. And I was interested in it. I found myself being able to stay engaged and really learn. And I got into that world and never really looked back. It took me a few years to take action. I allowed myself to get caught in paralysis analysis and I got a little bit fear-based and a lot of what ifs and I need to do I need to set up my entity and get my business cards and learn more and like I just put up all these barriers in front of myself that I thought I had to do before I got started when in fact we all know like you know the minimum viable product kind of a concept is just get oh, out yeah. there and start going start making money like don't try to build this enormous structure before you even know if that's something that's going to work for you so it took me a few years to get that through my thick head. But once I did, I was off to the races. It was legalized crack for me, buying and selling houses and flipping (laughs) houses. Like I was into it, man. And there was no stopping me at that point. It's the path so many are kind of born and raised with, Mike, go to school, get a good education, get a good job, invest in a retirement account and coast for 40 years, right? And retire one day if you're lucky, if you make it that far, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so I like what you did there. You know, you look down the line. I think this is a great advice for anybody listening is, you know, look to the people who are where you want to be or where you're on track to be. And then ask yourself is that's where you want to be. So, you know, if you're in that UPS job and you're looking those people that have worked for UPS for 40 years, and that's not the end you want for yourself, then You've got to figure something else out, right? That's what you did. Yep. You found yourself in the world of real estate investing. How did you kind of make that transition? What led you to real estate investing? So looking at the stocks and the stock market, that whole process led me into real estate. And then I started going to seminars and meetups and learning. You know, The thing that I found out, this is, I'm sure this is in any industry, you start getting interested in an industry like real estate and you start going to events for that industry and they inevitably have speakers at those events. And all of those speakers have a different way that they have been successful in that industry. And all of them make their way sound absolutely like the no-brainer way of doing it. Right. And you can get stuck in that mode of like shiny object, like, oh, that person makes sense to me. I'm going to do that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Now I heard this. And now this makes sense to me. I want to do this. And so that's what kind of stopped me a little bit. But the way that I made the transition from corporate life to full-time real estate investor was, I mean, this is not like sexy. And if people are leaning in and like ready to write down the magic bullet, here it is. Like I hustled, I worked hard. I worked my day job from eight in the morning until five o'clock at night. And then at five o'clock at night, I went out and looked at houses and I took a flashlight and I'm in Michigan. So in the wintertime, it's dark by five o'clock. And a lot of these houses I was looking at, this was back when there was a lot of foreclosures back in like 08, 09, 2010, there was no power. So I was getting into these houses. I was by myself in neighborhoods that were not necessarily sketchy, but they weren't exactly like, you know, they weren't, you know, like the best neighborhoods in the world. So I have flashlights. I'm in, it's Michigan again. So we have basements, right? So I'm in a dark basement, no power, no heat. It's freezing. It's creepy. Like you're walking through cobwebs, like the whole nine, right? Like I did that for a handful of years and hustled on the side until I could built my company up to the point that I felt like it could support my family without me having to stress out. Now, I'm a huge risk taker, right? And maybe some of people listening to this are like, I quit my job tomorrow if I thought I had a way to make money. I get it. I would have too if I was without kids or I wasn't married. Like, I'm fine to take that risk. But you know, I have a wife, I have kids, I have responsibilities. My wife is not the risk taker that I am. She's not down with like burn the boats and like no plan B. <laughs> I get that. And that all sounds yeah, right. You have a wife, husband or wife that you have to explain this to. So for me, I did the work. I put in the time. I hustled. I made a ton of mistakes for the first few years. Didn't make as much money as I probably could have for sure, but eventually kind of found my rhythm. And I basically t- sat my wife down and said, listen, you know, we've been doing this for years. I've been doing it for years. You know what's happening. Here's the deal. If I can put a year's worth of salary in the bank and not touch it, and then 
let me go eight months. I'll quit my job. Eight months later, if there's clearly no way in hell I'm going to be able to make this work, that gives me four months of runway still that I can use to go back and get a job if I want to, you know, if that's what it takes. And she was like, yeah, that's reasonable. Like it's the job market's strong. If you, you know, give yourself eight months of this, if we agree that it doesn't look like it's happening, you can go back into the job market. That's great. And that's what I did. And within two or three months, it was pretty obvious I was never going to have to go back because I was crushing my normal salary. So that's how I did it. I think it is a smart, kind of a safe way of going about it. Now, if I was 22 when this hall went down and I was without kids, without a wife, like I would have never worked for somebody ever. But as it turns out, I ended up working for someone by the time I quit. I think I had worked for someone for 20 years, somebody, not necessarily that company, but I worked 20 years. So I did this as like, in my mid to late thirties is when this all started for me. Yeah. That's such a good point. Mike is like that point, that secret sauce you said was just a hustle, right? And that's really what it boils down to. You know, if you're going to be a real estate investor, you got to, you know, start somewhere, you got to start, you know, side hustling on the day job, you know, moonlighting, going into places at night, or just whether that's physically going in a house or coming home and booting up the laptop and, you know, searching properties and running comps and, you know, just analyzing deals. It's what it takes. It's not very sexy. It's not very glamorous. And it's a hard sell to someone who's, you know, sitting at home in a comfortable lifestyle. So, you know, what was it that kind of drove you and motivates you to kind of, you know, do all those extra hours work and, uh, you know, get into the world of real estate? Yeah. Well, let me just say the secret sauce is hustle. And the person or the group of people that sort of, that it kind of sorts out are the folks who don't really want it that bad because it's not fun. I didn't think it was fun building my business, but it's not easy, right? But what drove me to do that, to work extra hours, like nights and weekends and every lunch hour was spent doing that, like what drove me? The same thing that should drive probably 80% of the people who are listening who have a job right now that work for somebody is that they don't love it. They're not fulfilled. That's probably best case scenario. They absolutely hate their job. That's the more likely scenario, or they don't like who they work for. Like I like the people I worked with. Like I had a lot of good friendships and things where I was working, but here's the deal. I lived for Friday. I couldn't enjoy Sunday afternoon because it was too close to the next day for me. And Mondays were like a death march into work. Like I didn't like it. I was in the automotive industry. And for anybody listening who's worked in an industry like that, it's full of a lot of people that aren't that happy. Like you guys drive cars and you get into your new, you know, 2020 car and you're like, this car is super awesome. Like it must be a blast to make these. It's not, okay? People in the automotive industry that I encountered over my 20 years were by and large not super happy people. It's a very, very stressful industry. So what drove me was just not being happy. And I'm over the years since I've had my own company and I've hired people and I've kind of gotten into that world of being a leader and hiring and all this, I've learned that personality assessments are very valuable. They don't tell the whole story, but a personality assessment will kind of give you your baseline. They'll tell you what your tendencies are without any outside influences. So what I've learned about myself over the years, if you look at my personality assessment, whether it's a DISC, a Colby, there's something called the culture index, which is highly accurate. If you look at any of those and look at my profile, I am not a profile of someone who is good at taking direction and being in line and following (laughs) orders. I'm not. And it sort of makes me a little bit jerky to have to like manage because I have my own opinions. I'm very opinionated. I'm very strong-willed. I'm a driver. Like I want to get things done. I'm super impatient. And really, probably that makes me really a bad employee is I'm not super detail-oriented. So I was always had positions <laughs> in companies later on in my career where I was managing people and I had to maintain spreadsheets and I had to hold people accountable. That's not really where I'm the best. Like, I'm the best when you like leave me alone and let me do what I got to do. Like, let me, I'm a little bit more of a lone wolf that way. So, I, in my companies, I hire folks that are good at managing people and watching spreadsheets because that's not what I do. I'm better at building and thinking and creating a little bit than I am following people and taking direction. So, I'm just not good. I wasn't built for that. And I realized it at some point, you know, early enough that I could do something about it. Sounds like the groundwork for a terrible job interview, Mike. Like you come in like, yeah, I don't really like taking direction. I'm pretty Dude. opinionated. I'm not detail oriented, uh, but this is going to work. Don't worry. Exactly. <laughs> I'm the reason I tell people like in the hiring process, anybody can be anything that they think they have to be for an hour, right? Oh, yeah. I was good at saying what I knew I needed to say to get a job, but I didn't even understand what, how I was wired. I wasn't really aware of that too much. So I kept saying like, 
why am I struggling to maintain these? You know, if you guys ever watch the movie Office Space, why am I having trouble with these TPS reports? Like, why can I not stay on top of the numbers? It's because that's I'm not wired to do that. You just it's I'm just not, you know. So I could say anything I needed to in an interview, and people do that. But once I got into the job, I was miserable. I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. So I mean, first you talk about like kind of having that passion, right? That's if you if you're not passionate and fulfilled at your job, then maybe that's an indicator you should look elsewhere. But another thing I know you're big on is scale. And there's only so many hours in a day. You know, you can only totally. work at a job 24 hours a day if you really wanted to, right? And your time's only so valuable. So, you know, you work 8, 10, 12, 16 hours a day, you make $20 an hour or $200 an hour. There's a ceiling and there's a cap yeah. to that success, right? Yeah. Whereas in other worlds, like real estate investing, you don't have that glass ceiling and you can scale and grow and there's really no limit to your success. That's what yeah. drives me about it. What's your take there? Yeah, 100%. I'm a big fan. And this is something, like I said, it wasn't on the menu for me growing up, but I'm a big fan of eating what you kill. I'm a big fan of, I will either starve or I will flourish, but it's going to be up to me. I would rather have that. I would rather bet on myself than to bet on a company that agrees to pay me $20 for every hour that I work. And then you can come to them and ask them if they will please let you go on vacation with your family for a week. Like, I get it. Like, there is a place for that. And some people, they are built more for that. I, I mean, I've got three kids. One of them is insanely entrepreneurial. She's very much an entrepreneur. Now, uh -huh. she does have a full-time job, but she's flipping houses on the side. She runs a private practice on the side and has a full-time job that she enjoys. But she's always looking at, how do I make money? How do I invest? How do I increase my ability to do things? And I've got two other kids that are not entrepreneurs. They're just not. It's just not in their DNA. They don't like the idea of going out and hunting. Like, they would rather work for a company. One of them's a teacher, right? She loves teaching. She loves kids. She likes the camaraderie and the environment. She just wants a structure that she can flourish in. That's totally fine. My other son is an engineer, right? So most engineers are not necessarily entrepreneurs. Those guys, you got to watch them. <laughs> you got to watch them. They're, they're smart guys, but they don't necessarily thrive on uncertainty, right? So and he's young. So I'll, in all fairness to him, he's 20. He could end up being an entrepreneur, but he doesn't appear to be that mindset. So everyone's different. You know, we need people that want to go in and do a job. There's nothing wrong with that. But for the folks that are not wired that way, you absolutely should not be in that environment because you're never going to be happy and you're never going to be as successful as you could be because you're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. And that's what I was doing for a number of years. Like I was just hammering that square peg in and the square peg was me and I didn't fit and I didn't realize I didn't fit. And the problem is the real like false positive is I was having some success. Like I was getting promotions and I was making good money. I just knew internally it all felt like I was going upstream. It didn't feel like it was natural for me to do what I was doing. And that's what ultimately led to me going out on my own. And once I did that and started eating what I killed and going out on my own, it was as if I finally turned around and was going with the stream. And it felt normal and it felt right. And it felt like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Mike, for those people maybe tuning in and listening right now, and they're thinking, yeah, something just doesn't seem or feel right, or I know there's something more out there for me. Do you think that that's kind of like a deep down gut feeling that you had at the time? Like, hey, you know, I know that there's this world out there. Or maybe you just didn't even know. And then one day something clicked. Yeah. I think part of it is, you know what the funny thing is? I felt that early on, like as a really young person, before I really got into my career, and I, the reason I say that it was happening then is it didn't happen as much as I got a little older. What led me to being an entrepreneur and going out on my own was misery. Like I was insanely miserable. But early on, before I had kids and a wife and all that, I always felt like I would go into work. I told, I was telling my friends this recently. Like I've never talked about this until just recently because it just occurred to me. I remember this. I would go into work and I had this weird feeling that I wasn't where I was supposed to be. Now, I know that sounds very like meta, like very like existential, but I just felt like this isn't where I'm supposed to be and I'm wasting time here. And once I think it happened early because it was sort of like my brain was a little more open to the possibilities of the world. Once you get a little older and you start having kids and a mortgage and a family, you almost get so bogged down in your responsibilities that your mind isn't open to like, what could I do? If I really was wanting to be happy, what could I do? And I think that's what happens. People sort of get stuck. They put their own handcuffs on themselves because they start making a decent wage and then they buy houses and cars and they build a lifestyle that requires all of that money every single week. 
And so the thought of like, how do I get out of this and do something I want to do is off the table because you can't. You've got this big thing that you have to, you have to manage and it takes money to do that. So sometimes when we're younger, we have these like thoughts like, what if I did something I really wanted to do? And then you get into your life and you get responsibilities and it doesn't happen. So my point is, if you're miserable, you're in a job you hate, you really need to start looking for a way out because even looking for a way out gives your brain something to like get excited about and allows you to start that process. That's what happened for me. I just was looking for a way to get out of my career sooner, not right away. Just I thought, you know, instead of retiring in 20 years, what if I could accelerate that and retire in 10 because I'm investing properly? And I thought that was going to be stocks and things like that. But once I found real estate, I went, whoa, there's an opportunity to leave my job much, much sooner and make more money than I'm making now. And I wouldn't even have to retire theoretically because what if I loved what I did? Like, what if you loved what you did? What if you woke up every morning and you said, I can't wait to start my day because I'm excited about what I do to make money? Then maybe you don't retire if you don't want to because you don't have to. People look forward to retirement. Why? Because they're miserable usually, you know? And people who are miserable are the ones who end up working until they're 65 or 70 or 75 because they just like it, right? But I wasn't in that camp. Yeah. Uh, Mike, what do you think is uh, most responsible for one's success? Would you say it's like, the idea of a better future or the fear of their current reality, if that makes sense. I really think that pain is a greater motivator than pleasure, unfortunately, for us. Mm -hmm. as Maybe this is just as an American. I don't know. Maybe other countries are different. But I think, like, I think you'll, run, you'll run faster when you're being chased by a bear than you will to get to a $1,000 prize. Like, I just believe that, right? Like you'll run like your life depends on it if a bear's chasing you. And I think sometimes fear and pain have to be the catalyst for you to go and make a change in your life. I even think there are some psychological studies that substantiate those kinds of ideas that, you know, fear is the bigger yeah. motivator than, you know, the option of a reward rather. Yep. That's why people say like people fantasize about like winning the lottery or being a, like, it's a very common thing when I was growing up in my world. For people to sit around and a pastime would be to fantasize what you would do if you won the lottery. What would you uh -huh. do with the money? We've all right? done it, right? <laughs> We've all done it, right? So, and we like to do that. It feels good, right? Psychologically, but it, it doesn't feel good enough to make us go, hey, wait a minute. We're probably not going to win the lottery, but what if we started a company and we made millions of dollars? Like, let's do that. It's like, nah, you just rather think about it, right? There's not enough pushing you. But, you know, when you're in a situation where it's, you know, sink or swim, you'll swim harder when you think you're going to drown than just for the leisure and the fun of swimming with your friends. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. that pain is a more of a motivator. I got, I had so much pain of being not happy in what I was doing. And then luckily I found something that I did love. And so I think when people say, follow your passion, like I'm not necessarily the guy who says you have to be passionate about everything, but I found something that I could be passionate about that also was a way out for me. And so that made it easier for me. So if you would have said, you've got to figure out stocks and that's the only way you're going to get out of your corporate life, I probably would still be in corporate life because I didn't like it enough to go through the tough times and the struggle to like make it work. I wouldn't have done it because I didn't like it enough. Talking about like the motivation of getting started, you know, one, like we all live relatively comfortable lives, right? With, you know, you're driving on the road right now, probably got this playing over your iPhone or Android. You know, you're going to go home. Things are good. Bills are paid. You live in the US, likely the large majority of our listeners do. Things are good. You're comfortable, but that's a dangerous place to be in because you don't have that fear and you maybe don't necessarily have that motivation to kind of push a little further. What's your idea there? I think you're 100% right. The worst possible thing that can happen to somebody is they get comfortable. It's the worst thing you can happen. So, you know, I'll take it in a different direction. So, my wife is an absolute like workout fitness person. She eats healthy, okay. right? Yeah. If she wasn't, it might be tempting for me to let myself go too, right? Like it would be comfortable. Like she eats terribly, I eat terribly. She won't work out. I don't have to work out. But because she's like this positive peer pressure, this sort of like something that keeps me from being comfortable with being a slob, like then I pay <laughs> attention and I go for it, right? So it's a small example and kind of a fun one, but you're 100% right. The worst thing can happen to somebody is they make just enough money to pay the bills, have a couple of nice things, and once in a while go on vacation. It's the worst possible scenario. You'd be much better off struggling to pay your bills, 
or having way more money than you need to, to live and have living that life, right? I think that middle of the road is where most people are. And it's, it's not coincidental. That's sort of how our society is built. Like companies are built basically to keep you needing them, but being comfortable enough to not leave. Like that's it. Yeah, that's interesting. How do you personally, Mike, kind of keep yourself uncomfortable? Because you do well. You're, you, know, you have your own business. You invest in real estate. You've got it going yeah. on. How do you keep yourself uncomfortable and you know, kind of keep pushing? Why not settle now that you're even more comfortable than you were 10, 20 years ago? It's funny. you know, When you get to a destination that you've been trying to get to, you can now see even farther. So for me, there's a couple of things that keeps me going. I wasn't raised to not have, I'm doing air quotes, to not have a guaranteed check on Friday. I wasn't raised to like eat what I kill. That wasn't how my family was. So there's always something inside of me that is afraid it's going to go away. Like because it's unnatural for me as a person in my environment that I grew up in. So I have this like unreasonable fear that everything's going to go away. I think a lot of, honestly, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have that where they're afraid of losing what they've worked for. But also, and I think this is probably you're going to have a lot of listeners who are not like completely on board with what I'm about to say, but I believe okay. it. it's not a universal truth. It's my opinion. I was raised in a house with all boys, which doesn't make me better or worse. It doesn't help or hurt, but we were raised in a very competitive environment. I was raised, I played sports. I was not encouraged to play sports. I was required to play sports. Everything in my house was about competition and it was very athletic focused and competition. For everything was a competition. You almost couldn't <laughs> ask my dad to engage in anything unless you were going to bet him on it or you're going to compete with him on it. So <laughs> I was raised to be competitive. And I think people who play sports, even as kids, just like as kids, now I'm not saying college and pro, I think. So when I hire, I like finding people who have some kind of a competitive sport background because I think the competition, the competitor in me always wants to do better. I'm always competing with myself. This is what I did last year. I want to do more this year. And because I know we've gone through the coronavirus, I've seen like 2008, 2009, the real estate industry where things went kind of topsy-turvy and everything went kind of to hell. I saw that happen. So I'm also aware that relying on one single stream of income is absolutely risky for me. I don't like that. So I'm always trying to think about how do I diversify and reduce my risk by having multiple streams of income? So for me, I'm looking at maybe three to five streams of income and I'm always watching. When one looks like it's not performing, I figure out why or I, I build another one, right? So I'm, I feel like I'm constantly like have my hands on these levers and I'm making sure that the water's flowing in all the directions. So it keeps me from getting complacent. I'm not complacent. And I also have like kids and I really want to build something that allows them to not ever have to worry about this kind of stuff. I'm just, I'm driven by legacy and I'm driven by competition and I compete with myself. I like that competition perspective. That's probably got at least some truth to it, you know? to see how, you know, just growing up with that competitive kind of lifestyle, you know, you carry those kind of characteristics into the business world, you're constantly yep. competing with other people or even yourself, right? So, yep. and it's interesting, the child of mine that I said is the entrepreneur, she's far and away the most competitive of my kids too. So there you go. For what it's worth. Now, if you didn't play sports and you're not competitive, don't get mad at me. I'm just saying it helps. Right, right. Sure. <laughs> Mike, let's kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about how you made the transition into the real estate world, what you do there, where you found your niche and kind of, you know, how you uh, built your business around real estate and yep. transitioned out of, you know, working for someone else. So I started off as a house flipper. That's all I really knew. I didn't know there was much else. I knew about rentals, but I just figured, you know, you need millions of dollars to buy rentals. Like I don't have that. So I can't buy rentals. So flipping made sense to me. This was back in 2008, 2009, when these flipping shows, and if you guys ever watched them, I mean, they still have them on HGTV, but the flipping shows now are way more feel good. Back then, they were much more stressful. They were people screaming and things going terribly wrong. And it was like the budget was all over the place. But that's what I knew that existed. So I started as a house flipper, did that for about five or six years with my wife was my partner for about the first three or four of that. And then she sort of said, mm, this up and down, this roller coaster life, this eating what you kill thing is not for me. Like, I'm a teacher. I just want to be a teacher. Like, you go do that and you have fun doing it and you're going to be fine without me. And I went and did that and that was fine. So I, I was a house flipper for a number of years. And at some point, I pivoted and I changed my model to more wholesaling and rentals. 
And it's not because house flipping wasn't great and it, it was sustainable and I was good at it and it was absolutely a, a viable option for me. But for me, one of the mistakes I made, and this is, goes back to the scaling aspect too, scaling your business. One of the mistakes I made was I had points, I had like keystones or failure points in my business that were absolutely dangerous. And it all sort of came back to bite me in the butt at the same time. So as a house flipper, a couple of things that are very important is knowing your numbers. You have to understand what the house could sell for once it's renovated. You have to know what to buy it for. And you need a contractor or somebody to tell you what it's going to cost to renovate it. Like That's the whole business. Like What can I sell it for? What do I have to buy it for? And what will it cost to fix it? Those are the high-level variables you need as a house flipper. Right. I was relying on other people to give me all of that information, all of it. I couldn't do it for myself. I had a realtor that told me what it would sell for, what I should buy it for. And I had a contractor that just told me what it would cost. I only had one contractor. I only had one realtor. And as it happened, there was a perfect storm. And on the same flip, my contractor kind of flaked out on me. And when I say flaked out, I mean, he stopped showing up when he was supposed to be there. He started overcharging me for things that didn't need to get done. He started trying to charge me for things that he didn't do. My realtor missed what we call ARV, after repair value. He missed on the what it could eventually sell for. He was a mile off. And the worst part about it was mistakes happen. I don't necessarily condemn people for making mistakes. But two things. He lived in the neighborhood that he was giving me the comp for. So I thought a guy who had been a realtor for 20 years giving me a comp in his own neighborhood, that I should be able to take that to the bank. Yeah, and the second bank. thing was, once he realized, and we both kind of realized that his number was way, way off of what he gave me, his reaction was along the line, I'm paraphrasing, but they were along the lines of, what are you going to do? Things happen. And I was like, Oh no, no, no. That is not the kind of taken responsibility for what you did that I wanted to hear. Now, if you would have said, you're absolutely right. This is how it happened. This is why I miscalculated. I can't believe I did that. I will never let that happen again. I apologize. It's all my fault. I could have lived with that, honestly. Mm -hmm. But is, when he was, he was kind of like, hey man, what do you want from me? Kind of an attitude. I was like, oh boy. So I had to go away from him. My contractor, I had to stop using him. And at the time, I was still getting deals. Like I was still getting opportunities to sign contracts, but I had no way to like, flip them. I just lost my capacity, right? So I found out about something really quick called wholesaling, right? I sign a contract with a seller. I go and find a house flipper or landlord who would like that property to either flip or hold as a rental. I give them a price that's higher than the price that I agreed on with the seller. And I take what's in the middle, right? It's called wholesaling. Right. I figured that process out in, during that time. And what I realized was as I wholesaled the next couple of deals to other investors, I really, really liked that process. I really enjoyed going out, finding the deal, taking it to someone who's struggling to find a deal, marking it up and selling it to them and never dealing with contractors, never dealing with realtors, never dealing with banks, never dealing with appraisers, and getting in and out of it and getting my money within a few weeks. Like That absolutely appeals to everything on my personality assessment that I talked about earlier. It completely lines up with my personality. That's how I like to operate. I like to drive. I have no patience and I don't want to get bogged down in details like bam, bam, in and out, make money and go. So I switched my model and I went from doing a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year to over a million dollars in profits the next year when I switched my model because I found something that fit my personality and I went after it like a man possessed. Talk about the scale component of that particular investment strategy, that particular niche of wholesaling. These, you see people doing a significant volume being successful at that. Was any part of that a reason you kind of transitioned to that strategy? No, it wasn't. And honestly, I'll be honest. So it all coincided with when I switched and pivoted my model. But what got me to scale? And by the way, in hindsight, if I were to start over, if, I, if someone said, I challenge you, right? I'm competitive. I challenge you to build a flipping company and scale it the way you did your wholesaling company. I think I could do that because scaling is independent of the model. And so when I learned to scale, when I really got my company dialed in, I joined a mastermind called Seven Figure Flipping. And this was a small mastermind with folks who were had some level of success in real estate. And we all got together four or five times a year and we shared ideas and collaborated. We had a Facebook group. And that group and that mastermind was really what unlocked it for me. I had all the drive and the desire in the world. But it's, it's so much easier, Jacob. If you're a house flipper or a wholesaler or whatever, and you've got a business that's four or five times as big as mine, and I sit you down and say, can you just, what did you do to go from where I am to where you are? Now, 
just because you did it and it worked for you doesn't mean it's 100% guaranteed. But I would rather look at your playbook and use your hindsight as my foresight, right? How, yeah, how many times sure. do people say hindsight's 2020? Yeah. Well, what if I could use your hindsight and that's my foresight and now I can just replicate what you did and, and do it. So that's what I did. And I found some folks that were ahead of me in the game and sat them down and they were real honest with what they did right, but what they did wrong too, which was super, super important to know what they didn't do well. And, you know, I was raised, like I said, I told you my dad worked automotive industry. What I didn't tell you was, is he was a Marine. So I'm real good at taking direction, right? So if I, <laughs> I said, I'm not good at taking direction in a company sense. That's true. But if I want to do something, and I go to someone for their expertise, I'm not a wishy-washy like, yeah, well, I don't know if it's going to work for me. Like, If I come to you, Jacob, and say, what do I have to do to scale my business and to make more money, and I believe you have the answer, I will do what you say. And I did that. I was an insane. I just started executing on what they were telling me. And I did. And I scaled it. And some of the things that I did, some of the things that I wasn't doing that I learned, and I'm sure people are like, that's great, Mike, but what? tell me what you actually did. So there was a couple of things. Number one, I learned how to hire effectively. I really didn't hire by prior to like surrounding myself with the right people because I thought I was too small to hire. But I thought I was too small to hire, but I thought I'm never going to get any bigger if I don't bring in some help, right? So it's like this circular kind of defeating catch logic. Catch-22, like, right? Yeah, it's a catch-22. And I realized you can hire as a small company. You can build a team, right? They don't have all had to be W-2 employees with a base salary. Like, there's commission and there's other things you can do. You can think outside the box and be creative to find people to hire, to build your team, to help you build and scale your company. So hiring effectively was one thing. Learning how to track my numbers. I wasn't tracking numbers. I knew money was coming in. I knew money was going out. I didn't know how much of either. I didn't know exactly why it was coming in and going out. I didn't know what marketing channels were working for me. I had no idea. So when I started, you know, and I always tell people, it's kind of like getting in a plane, like, you can get off the ground without the instrument panel in a plane. Like you can get airborne, right? But once you're up in the air, if you like blindfold the person and turn off all their gauges, like you don't know if you're going up or down, if a tree is coming, if a building, if a mountain's coming, right? It's the same thing with a business. It's one thing to get your business off the ground, right? To start generating some kind of revenue. It's a whole nother thing to grow it and to be profitable while you grow it and to understand your numbers. So until I started building that instrument panel around me so I understood the health of my company, I couldn't grow because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know which levers to pull to grow. So once I figured out the levers, I could grow effectively. And then the other thing was just really learning how to lead people. Like The biggest mistake I saw in the automotive industry when I was in that industry was they would go into like the engineering department, for example, and they would take the most successful, talented engineer in that department and they, they would promote him or her to the engineering manager of the department. Now they're not doing the work anymore. They're managing people doing the work. And as it turns out, highly skilled engineers are not necessarily highly skilled leaders. They're good at engin- being an engineer. They're not great at managing a team of engineers. And so that experiment failed a lot of times. And what happens to entrepreneurs, you start your company, you're wearing all the hats. You get good, maybe really good, or at least proficient at doing everything in the company. And then you hire people and you're no longer doing the work. You're managing someone doing the work. You're leading someone doing the work. You're hiring someone. You're trying to motivate and inspire and train someone to do the work. Completely different skill set. And I think until people realize that and they treat being a leader with the same veracity and the same tenacity and the same interest that they treated being good at learning to be a technician inside their company, in other words, I learned how to comp properties and I learned how to manage a renovation, manage the budgets and the timelines. I spent time, money, and effort getting help and training and coaching and learning about how to do that. Well, once you do that and then you start take, removing yourself from that activity, you have to find coaches, you have to learn, you have to educate yourself on how to lead a team, how to grow a company. It's a different skill set and people assume it'll just come naturally to them, right? And it doesn't. It's just why you see like a great athlete. Sometimes great athletes make good coaches. Most times they don't because they're good at playing the game. They're not necessarily good at coaching the game. And you become a good player on the field and then you expect yourself to rise to the level of head coach or GM. Why would you be good at that? Just because you were good on the field. That doesn't mean you're going to be a good coach or GM. And so that's the real thing that I had to learn too, how to become a better leader. Oh, that's such great and valuable advice there. I'm just thinking to myself what you mentioned there about uh, you know, bringing on people to kind of complement your weaknesses, right, and help outsource things. 
in today's day and age and in gig economy, you don't necessarily have to have a team of 20 people sitting in an office in no. cubicles full time, right? You know, you can outsource things. You can use things like Upwork and hire on a contract basis, on a commission basis and all these things. So today's day and age, even people getting started have the ability and the resources at the hand to go out and hire tasks or things that they're not good at, right? Or things yep. that maybe they're incapable of build a website or cold calling or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, man. hundred percent. So let's kind of talk about how you've kind of grown and scaled your business. What kind of characteristics do you attribute that to in addition to, you know, just being a good leader? Yeah. So it's funny you ask that. You know, my answer, sometimes you probably know this, Jacob, you've talked to so many people. The true answer, the actual answer for a lot of questions isn't the one people expect and it's not the sexy one all the time. Okay. What I have come to realize is if you give me two people, right, and you say, okay, I'm challenging you to try to make these two people successful in whatever business or whatever endeavor they're trying to be successful in. If I spend a little bit of time with each of them, and one of them, let's just say one of them is highly intelligent, very analytical, you know, like nothing is too hard for them to figure out, like they got all that. And the other one, maybe not quite so, so intelligent, but just like a crazy work ethic and fearless. I'll take the crazy work ethic and fearless over the highly, highly analytical, intelligent person every day. Because what I have found is success is way more about execution and taking action than it is knowing everything or having the perfect plan or having a business plan that is like impeccable. Like it just isn't about that or having a logo that blows people away. Like success is action and getting started is the hardest thing. It's by far the hardest thing to do. And so for me, I'm lucky. I always tell people like, I went to this thing with friends recently. It was a little retreat with some friends of mine. And there was like a dozen of us. And there was a there's cliff that you could climb up to it and jump off. And half the people did it, half the people didn't. Now, you might think, listening to me, start my own company, like all this stuff, take a risk, I buy these million dollar properties, that I would be one of the people up there jumping, right? I have no desire to jump off a cliff. I have no desire to, desire to skydive or to bungee jump. However, what I was given, a God-given thing, is I have absolute insanely high risk tolerance when it comes to like financial risk or business risk like that doesn't scare me at all so when i started building my company people would ask me like i was making offers on property like it was going to keep me alive like i was making multiple offers on multiple properties i had no idea how i was going to finance all of them and people were like what if you just made five offers today on houses what if all five of them get accepted and i said that, great. I'll figure it out. Like, I don't care. But to them, the people asking me, they were like petrified. Like, what are you going to do? You don't have the money to buy all these, right? And I was like, I'll figure it out. I'll get the money. Like, I don't care, right? So that scares a lot of people to operate that way. It doesn't scare me. That's how I am. So I think having a high risk tolerance is absolutely helpful when you're trying to build a company. Now, you don't want to be careless or like foolish, right? But there is a fine line between foolish, careless, and brave. There's a fine line. I consider that line, I'm on the other side of the line when it comes to like bungee jumping, no desire, skydiving, <laughs> no desire. But the people that I see, like I know people who have sky skydived and bungee jumped, they would never in a million years want to live a day in my life of what the risks that I take from a business standpoint, right? So it's just, it's risk tolerance, it's work ethic, and it's people who are willing to go out there and not make excuses. I worked with these people, man, for a number of years people who blamed everybody except themselves for what was going on in their life. And so you give me, I told you two scenarios. If one of them also is an extreme like ownership person, like they take ownership of everything that happens to them, good and bad. They don't blame the government. They don't blame the president. They don't blame their parents. They don't blame their wife, their husband, their boss. They don't blame anybody. They take it all in. That person is a winner. They will be a winner. Totally. So I like to coin this term, or I think I've coined this term, like this learn-do ratio, right? And on one hand, you have people who are just always learning that analytical person. They're never taking action. And then you've got the people who are jumping off the cliff and figuring out how high it is after they've jumped, right? Somewhere in the middle, I think you've got to kind of find yourself. And I call that like this learn-do ratio. Now you talk about taking risk in, in business sense, right? I think a good hedge against risk is education, right? So what one might look at what you're doing as risky, it's really not risky. You've been there, you've done that, you've bought that property in that neighborhood, you know, or whatever that, whatever it is you're doing. So that hedge against risk really comes down to the education piece, in my opinion. 
Yeah. The learn do ratio. I've never heard that. And I, you're right. There is a ratio. And I'll tell you, when I told you, it took me a few years to kind of get my butt off the couch and start like actually taking action. That learn do ratio was super lopsided. It was like 99 to one. Like I was not doing anything right okay. now. My learn ratio, if I'm going to use your term is probably, you know, 10%, 90%. Like, honestly, I will start something like I will jump off the cliff, metaphorically jump off the cliff and I'll build the wings on the way down. Like I'm no problem with that. I started a business a month and a half ago and it's already generating $10,000 a month and I'm still learning the business. Like I'm not even sure exactly if I'm doing everything right. Like I'm learning it now. I'm meeting with attorneys and CPAs to make sure that I've got everything structured properly. And now most people look at that and go, what do you mean? What are you a moron? No, I just knew that I needed to prove a concept. I needed to make sure it was going to work and it was going to be something that I wanted to do. And now that I see that, oh, this has legs and I actually can scale this quite a bit, I need to make sure that I'm setting it up properly. Yeah, sure. That's awesome. Mike, we could talk about entrepreneurship and scaling business and stuff all day, but let's go ahead and wrap up with the lightning round. Just a series of questions we end with all of our guests. Are you up for it? Let's do it, man. I'm always up for it. All right. First question is, what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate? And then what'd you do to overcome that? My biggest hurdle was absolutely fear. I think that's most people's hurdle, whether they say it's something else or not. Yeah, you can blame you know losing money or looking stupid, but it was just fear, basically. I blamed a lot of things. The way I got over it was I was raised by a Marine, right? I wasn't really raised to... Fear wasn't tolerated in my family. And once I kind of internalized what was going on and I realized I was afraid... I became absolutely sick about it. Like I was disgusted with myself and it motivated me. Mike, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? Wow. That's a great question. So personal habit, I think I'm good at compartmentalizing. When I'm done for the night, in other words, I'm done. I can turn it off. I can forget about the problems. I can sit down and have a nice evening with my wife, go out to dinner, watch a movie. And that allows me to unplug and sort of reset for the next day. For me, that's critical. I couldn't be successful if I could never turn it off in my head, I can turn it. I can compartmentalize pretty well. So that helps me. Yeah, super valuable. Yep. Mike, do you have an online resource you find valuable in your day to day? It's a great question. This is really kind of like lame and it maybe is going to show my age, but I find YouTube to be insanely useful and helpful. I YouTube every single thing in my life that I want to know how to do. That's where I go first. So you I'm, can literally I'm, learn anything there. <laughs> literally learn anything. Mike, what book would you recommend to the listeners and why? Okay. I won't say my own book. That's a little too self-serving. But if I had to pick another book, I'm going to say two because I think they're both valuable for completely different reasons and I'll be fast. One of them is Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. I mentioned Extreme Ownership. I think it's lacking in our society. Bad. So I think that's one book. The other book is called Traction. It's by Gino Wickman and it's how I run my business. It's a very simple, easy to understand process for running and scaling a business. Yeah, I'm listening it to it for the second time right now. And then Extreme Ownership, I think I listened to that twice as well by Jocko Willink. Yep. Let's go down a rabbit hole really quick. I know that you actually have shared the stage with people like Jocko Willink, like yep. Gary Vaynerchuk, like Tom Ferry, so many others. Tell us about how you've come across to do that and what it was like doing that. So there's been two main avenues that I've been lucky enough to share the stage with some of these folks. One of them was I was invited by Gary Vaynerchuk to speak at his agent 2021 back in 2018. And that's where I got on stage with some of those folks, lots of cool people there. So that was an an experience of a lifetime. It was very cool to get that invitation. And if anybody's a fan of Gary Vaynerchuk, it was a very Gary Vaynerchuk-esque way of getting invited. He had never met me. He never spoke to me directly, but he invited me to speak almost sight unseen. I think he heard my podcast and like, I reached out to him and I think he did 10 minutes of research he heard me talk, said, okay, this guy can speak. Like, let's just get him there. Right. So it was crazy. Like, I wouldn't invite someone to my event that fast, but he did. So it's awesome. I appreciate it. The other way is there's an event that I speak at every year. It's a big event, usually over 800 people to 1,000 people at the event. It's called Flip Hacking Live. And yeah. that's where I actually met and spoke on stage with Jacko Willink, for example, had dinner with him, uh, was able to kind of mingle with him for a couple of days. It was very, very cool. But those two events is where I've been mostly on stage with some of these folks that were just amazing. I mean, Russell Brunson, I I was able to share the stage with him. Yeah, just a lot of people. Annie Dukes, I just had a chance to share an an event with her. So just a lot of cool people that I've been able to meet. No, I know I had to ask that. So a good way to work it in there. Let's jump (laughs) back to the lightning round. Last question. If you're to go back and give advice to your 20-year-old self to get started investing in real estate, what would you tell yourself? Boy, it's easy. Two things. I would say, number one, 
like I would shake him and say, listen, wake up. You're not on a path that's leading to somewhere that you want to go. So you need to figure it out. And the second thing is I would say, sit down right now and make a plan for how you're going to get out of this situation that you're in right now. You're young, you have plenty of time, but you're never going to get anywhere with unless you make a plan. I tell my kids this, and I tell people this all the time. You can decide and you can make a plan for your life or life will make a plan for you. And the plan that life makes for you will almost never lead you where you want to go. So if you don't want to just be carried down the stream by the current and end up wherever life takes you, you better figure out what you're going to do, make a plan and execute it. And I would say, make a plan. And here's what's going to happen if you stay in this trajectory. You're not going to be happy. So make a plan and go in a different direction. That sounds like advice coming from someone who was raised by a Marine dad. So yeah, I would definitely take it as well. Well, Mike, you've been creating a ton of great content for years now across both your podcast and your book. So tell us about both of those. Okay, we will do. Thank you for that. So the podcast is called Just Start Real Estate. I started it in 2013. The goal there was to help... Ed- I'm an introvert by nature. I'm not like someone who goes and I don't necessarily enjoy the process of networking. I know it's absolutely critical for almost any industry, but I would go to these networking events as a younger person before I got really going. And I, I was afraid to ask questions because I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to bother people. So I started my podcast to really help folks not only get started, but to answer questions that they have nowhere else to go to find a legitimate answer, just straight answer, not like a sales pitch, just answers to questions that they need. So that's why I started my podcast. It goes strong seven years later. So you can check that out. The book I wrote because I got a little bit of fame because I took a business that was sort of like young and I was doing a few deals and I scaled it up to doing over 10 to 12 and sometimes 15 deals a month. I was able to generate a million dollars in profits within 12 months. And so that started being how I got to be known in some of these circles. And I would talk and they would go, this is the guy who made you know, over a million dollars a year. And so people would always ask me, how did you do it? What did you do? What were the steps you took? What were the things that you changed in your business as a small business struggling to do that and scale up so fast? And so I wrote the book to try to answer those questions. The book is called Level Jumping. And I called it Level Jumping because I feel like if you put yourself in the right rooms and you do the right things, you can not only take your business to the next level, you can skip levels. Like You can literally jump like you did as you're, when you were a kid. I don't know if anyone else did this. When I'd go upstairs, I would go two at a time when I was a kid because I was just in a hurry <laughs> and I was a kid. I do that in business now too. I go upstairs two at a time in my business because I put myself in the right environments and I learn from the right people. So go get that at level jumping, get on Amazon. If it's cool with you, I can give your listeners a free digital download of the entire unabridged book. If you want oh, to yeah, absolutely it digitally, yeah. yeah, you can just text the words, two words now, text the words, just start to the number 55444. So the number 55444, text two words, just start, and you'll get the whole book for free. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Mike. That's just start. Text those two words to 55444. We'll link those instructions in the show notes along with your podcast, Just Start Real Estate. Great podcast. In terms of podcasting world, seven years ago, you've been doing that for now. That's like 20 years in podcasting years, right? In in dog years, rather. So awesome stuff. Well, Mike, hey, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's been a lot of fun talking with you. Look forward to having you back on in the future. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, Mike. Take care. You too. All right. That wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Mike Simmons. Hey, what an awesome conversation with Mike. I hope you got so much value from that interview. For all those resources we mentioned, as always, you can find those in the show notes by tapping on your screen or going to www jacobayers.com where you can find all of the shows. Well, hey, I really hope you're getting value from this podcast. If you like today's show and you're liking the show so far, please go over and subscribe and leave a rating and review. That would mean so much to the show. Well, as always, until next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.